So I see Glenda and Michelle are here, and Tom has stepped away temporarily. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Today we're doing Outlook 2007 Advanced training, and our presenter is again Lynn Mann from the At One Trainers Resource Bureau. All right. Well, then we're going to go ahead and get started. So, Lynn, uh, take it away. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Now, I do want to give you a little bit of warn word of warning. I am in my office today, and the switching back and forth of the application is just going to be a little delayed. The reason is I have four monitors, and for some reason that switch just takes a little moment. It, it stutters just a little bit because it, I guess it gets confused on where to go. So that's one thing. The second thing is I have Outlook 2010, so it's going to look slightly different. I mean, just minutely different than what you have with your full version of Outlook 2007. So when I know there's going to be a difference, I'll let you know. For example, we're going to talk about distribution lists. Well, distribution lists no longer quote unquote exist in 2010. They now call them groups. So the only change there is what they call them. Okay. So today we're going to cover some uh, advanced features in Outlook 2007. And for my case, you're going to see it in 2010. So we're going to talk about some mail options in your signature, context and distribution list, path, calendar, and then we're going to open it up to any questions and topics you may want me to cover. I'll do my best to answer your questions on the fly. So let's go ahead and start with mail options in our signatures. So we're going to talk about flagging messages, some options that we have, signatures, and then including a business card in your calendar uh, to include that in with an email going out the door. Now I do want to state my email is my email. My Outlook is my Outlook I am using. So occasionally you will see things pop up into my email because it is active. So I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop with you. That wasn't too bad. It popped right up. So you'll see this is my platform of Outlook 2010. And it's very similar to 2007 except the file tab came back, so no more office button. And then the others are, are pretty similar to it. I do want to kind of go over what you're looking at here. Since my email account is going to look different than you, yours, I do want to talk about my environment just for a split moment. So off to the left, I have my folder set up, how I organize things. I actually have two servers that I work with. One is my Exchange server, and that's this mailbox area my inbox, any of my drafts, my sent, my deleted, junk mail, the standard stuff, and I have some RSS feeds. This is my exchange server. This is what my company supplies to me. But because I like to keep a lot of emails and I like to, to keep those for future reference, I have a plethora, a big group of uh, emails that they don't want on their second server that I work with. And that's my personal archive here. And so you'll see if I close it down, you'll see all my folders open up. And this is just how I've, I've arranged my folders to keep me more organized. So I wanted to talk about that. And then here's my inbox right in the middle. And then my rightmost pane is my calendar and my to-do list and things like that. So. That's my screen. So while we're in here, you'll see that I have some emails coming through, and I might use these to play with to show you some, some features and stuff. So I want to talk about some mail options with flagging. Flagging can signify that you need to do something, and then also it can organize. So I'm going to flag one of these emails. You can do it superficially just by clicking on the flag. That puts a default flag 
on the email saying, hey, you have some things to do. And you'll see that it pops up here on my right-hand side. Now, you might be asking me, why do I have two of them? Well, it's a glitch. So if I selected another email to flag and say, hey, I need to do something about this, by default it sets a flag for today. So I click on flag, and you'll see in my to-do list it puts two of them. It's a glitch with 2010. For you, it would do one flag. And unfortunately, if I click on one to delete it, it deletes both. So it's a glitch. But let's say I don't necessarily want to I want to flag this item, but I actually want to take care of it tomorrow or at a future date. So what I'll do is instead of just clicking on the flag, I'm going to right click on the flag. Now what happens is that I have some options. This is one way of doing it. So if I want to say either today, tomorrow, next week, or a custom date, I can choose that. I can also add a reminder. Now what a reminder does is it pops up a little box, and you may see this, because remember this is my active outlook, that it will pop up a box reminding me that something is going to occur. And then I can say, okay, I'm going to actually do this one as a custom. I'm going to say, hey, a follow-up, or I can say, for my information, no reply necessary, read or reply. I have the choice. By default, it's follow-up, so I'm going to keep it as follow-up. I'm going to start this today, but I need it ended by, let's say, the 15th of April, tax day. And I'm going to set a reminder. And the reminder I actually want on April 14th, the day before. And let's say I want it at noon. So I'm going to choose a time. Yeah, let's say noon. And I can choose the noise, but this is just going to do the default noise. I'm going to say OK. Now you'll see that it's a little lighter pink, and that in my lower right-hand corner, I have a reminder that it will chime at that specific day, at that specific time that I told it to, to remind me, hey, you need to complete this. The other way I can do that is that's just by right-clicking. The other one is I'm going to choose another email. Here I've got one that I've already taken care of. But I'm going to go ahead and say, oh, here we go, a newsletter. Why not? Right up here on my ribbon, I have the option of a follow-up. The same thing. It adds that same dialog box. And I can choose from there. So I'm just going to say, hey, next week. But now what I want to do is, that's great that I can have all of these reminders. But as you can imagine, it can get pretty crowded. and disorganized if I don't use some kind of filing system. So what I use is I place a category to this item. And since this has to do with our technology, what I can do is create a technology category and put that category on this where it will break it up instead of just none, it will break it up into a separate category down here. That way, if I had to deal with budget, I have all of my budget to-do list in a basically a budget to-do list. If I had a schedule to-do list, then it's under a schedule to-do list, to -do list. So it's under specific category. So I know I don't have a technology category. But I am going to go up here, click on Categories, and I'm going to say All Categories. This opens up my dialog. Or a new category. You see, I have lots and lots of categories. I use this all the time. So I'm going to create a new category. I'm just going to call it technology. And I'm going to give it a color. That way, whatever has to deal with that topic has that specific color. Now I'm limited on the number of colors that I can apply, but let's say Technology, I'm going to say it's dark teal. Don't know why. I can even apply a shortcut key, and I say OK. Now it puts it on my list, and it's already selected, and I say OK. Now put this bar up at the top. I called it technology, and down here on the right bottom hand corner, now I have this category of technology. So if I was to grab another email 
and apply a category. I can either go up here and say category technology, or I'm going to take off that category right now and say clear. Or right here, and I just want to make this a little bit larger so you can see it. Right here where it says categories, I can actually click in here. Right click and say technology. I can apply it either way, either going up to the ribbon or right click. Basically, if you right click on anything, you can figure out what you can do to it. Great. And then I, I do want to flag this with some type of date. Right now, it defaults with nothing. So I'm going to go ahead and right click. And I'm going to say, hey, let's make this actually no date, that it never expires. That's something that I need to keep going, keep going, keep going. So that's categories, playing with categories. I'm going to grab one more. And let's see, here we go. And I'm going to create a category or call this um, just important. And I'm going to flag it. So you'll see, every time I have a different I break them up into that category. And I do apologize for the glitch of repeating these twice every time I do one. For yours, you would not have that repeated just once again. So any questions on flagging an item and creating a custom or using a category that already exists? All righty. So let me go ahead and start talking about the options in, now I can remove the flags too, so that's just removing the flags. I showed you that already. Um, but I do options. So for this, I'm going to open up a new email. I just clicked on new email. I have this new email. And on options tab, you'll see I have all different kinds of options here. One is to apply a theme, show field. So right now I'm showing the from, the to, and the cc. But if I need to show the bcc, I can click on the bcc, which is blind carbon copy. <laughs> then you can also, when you're sending out your email, you can also apply the voting button which means when your recipient gets it, it's prompting them, as long as they have 2007, it's prompting them to vote on something, either yes or no. So let's say I'm going to do a potluck for my office, and I say, OK, to all these people, uh, we're having a pot potluck. Are you going to join? So I'm going to say, use voting button. And I can say either yes or no, yes, no, or maybe, approve or reject. So this is a yes or no situation. I don't know if I want them to say maybe, and then I buy you know, a whole bunch of, of fruit or whatever, and then they don't show up. So maybe a yes or no is appropriate. So when I send this, and I'm going to just send it to myself, and I say potluck, it will come to me with voting buttons. The other thing I can do is I can request a delivery receipt or request a read receipt or both. One is that they've actually going that they've opened it up and they've read it. The other is they just got it. Upon getting it, it asks for a prompt. So I'm going to say, hey, request a read receipt just for this example. And I'm going to send it. Send it. Send, send. There we go. So now in my inbox, here's my email. Once I open it, it asks me, do you want to send a read receipt? Say yes. And so by ticking yes or no, which is right up here, here's my voting, I'm going to say yes. And my choices are, hey, send now, or do I want to send an edit uh, message back? with it. So this is just sending my response. And I'm going to say OK. And you'll see, if I close this out, I have my reply. And I say yes. So right there in the subject, it says yes. 
Now, the good part about this is when I get all the responses from everybody, I can sort this by subject, and I can just count really quickly who said yes and who said no. So let me close that out, and I'll start another email. Go to options. So I, I'm going to deselect my blind carbon copy, because I actually don't want to show my blind carbon copy. In business, it's unprofessional to use it, and so that's why by default it doesn't show, I guess. So I want to talk about, so when I send this, and I send it to a group of folks, what I could do is I can immediately direct my replies to a certain folder. So right now it says, I mean, to a certain person. So I can say, have the replies sent to not me, but somebody else. This is great if you sent it on behalf of somebody else. So my department chair here is named Bill Bergen. So if I send out an email on behalf of Bill Bergen, that I want to have the replies sent to him. And then if I want to save a copy of the sent message, remember that's from me, I can do that as well. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about here, is sending your replies to somebody else versus you. So again, I can select some names. Say OK. So this time, the reply will be sent to me as well as Bill, or I can take myself off entirely out of the chain, and I can say, OK, close. So now when I send it, whoever gets back, Bill is going to get the reply as well as I'm going to get the reply. Any questions about direct replies to? Pretty straightforward. It's nice and, and simple. Now, what I don't know is what the person sees in terms of do they know or do they have some trigger, as in the recipient of the email, that their reply is going to go to both Bill and myself? That I don't know. So I'm going to test it out here and send an email to myself. And I'll have to explain this to Bill later, but we'll say we're testing direct replies to you. I'm going to say send. So here's my email. And I'm going to reply. And it actually does show it. So it will say reply to Lynn and Bill. So there's nothing secret about it. You're going to know. And if I go ahead and reply, I can still change this. I can take Bill off the distribution list. So it's not a permanent. It's just a request, in essence, when you're sending it to the recipient that when they automatically hit the reply, that it will go to the people that you want. So let's talk about, I'm going to open up that new email again. And the next thing I want to talk about is delay delivery. So if I click on delay delivery, you get that same pop-up. All of these are in the same pop-up. So here was my have reply sent to but do not deliver before is also in this options dialog box. Let's say I compose an email today, but I don't want it delivered to anyone until next Tuesday. Then I can do my work today and then set this do not deliver before to Tuesday at a specific time. at a certain time. That's in the event that your Exchange server is down, I believe. I don't ever use the expire after. And then I can send it out. That's to generic everybody that I, I, I just send this email out to, to flow this email. And I can say, here's my email. It's going to be coming in on the 5th or, or whatnot. If I've composed my email, I'm just setting it up for today for a future delivery delay the delivery date. Pardon me. 
the last item I want to talk to or talk to you about is save sent item two. So if I click on save sent item two by default, I know this is a shocker, but it goes to your sent folder. But I don't necessarily have to do that. I can either say use default folder, which is your sent, or I can say do not save. So for this email, it's not going to save a copy. Or I can specify a specific folder that I want to send it to. For example, sometimes I want my sent items not to go to the exchange server, but in the sent items, but maybe I want it to go to draft for some reason. Well, then I would say, send it to draft, and I'd say, okay. Then it would go to that specific folder. Or, here's another option I can see using this, is if I'm composing an email, and it has to do with, let's say, a specific topic, uh, schedule. And I save all of my sent items in a folder called uh, schedule, then I can direct it to that folder instead of later on having to move it out of my sent into the directed folder for organization issues. So, so far, are there any questions? I'm just going to toggle that off because I don't need to send it at a later date. Any questions regarding the more options, the tracking, or the showing of the field? I'm going to take that as a no. So let's go ahead and jump over to insert. Since I have this area open, I want to talk about signatures. Signatures is exactly this. This is my signature. On all new emails that I compose, this goes out to on the email. I don't have to type it in every time. It just goes out. And I actually see I need to change this up because we no longer, in my office, I no longer have a fax. So I'm going to show you how to edit a signature. You must open up an email. You can't do it from your inbox. You have to open up an email. It can be blank. It could be an email that you've already composed. But it needs to be an email so you can get to the signature, which is right here. I'm going to click on the arrow and say signatures. Now here's my new outgoing. That's what I named it. And it already opens it up. So I'm going to scroll down here and I'm just going to delete that last line of the fact. And I'm going to say hit save. Now I'm going to close this email out. I'm going to open up a new one. And you'll see the fax is gone. But I don't want to have to sit on every single new email or every single reply. So sometimes I want a specific signature for specific emails, like my replies. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new signature. So I'm going to go to Insert. Again, I have to open up an email. Go to Insert, Signatures, and click on Signatures. I want a new signature. So I'm going to click on New. And I'm going to give it a name. And I'm going to say Reply. Say OK. Now, I'm going to say, right now it says it's new messages, new outgoing. I don't want that. I'm just going to say it's on Reply. Or I can also select on Reply and Forward and say that Replies as well. Okay. So now I'm going to create it. Thank you. Then, I mean, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be crazy. But this, I'm going to send my business card with it. So right now, I can choose a business card of me if I have one. If not, I'll create one. There I am. And it will put in all this information. Say OK. That's my business card. I say OK. So now every time I reply, that signature is going to be put automatically on my reply. If I think that signature is a little lengthy just for a reply, then I can go back to my signatures, 
go to my reply signature and say edit it right out so I don't need my business card. I'm going to delete my business card. And it's just going to say thank you, Lynn. Now you might say, well, why would I create a full signature just for thank you, Lynn? Well, it actually speeds you up quite a bit. That's why you put signatures on things. I can also say I want to direct all or have on all of my replies are company websites. So I can text to display. I'm just going to say HTTP SKP.edu. We'll call it. I'll say OK. So now every time that my reply goes out, I want a little bit of space on the top. This is what my reply is going to be. So let's test it out. I'm going to reply to the potluck. And we'll reply to testing direct reply. There you go. Thank you, Lynn, with the website. That's using signatures, creating a signature, editing a signature. I could have added a picture in there. That's just copy and paste. Um, Signatures are great. It actually saves quite a bit of time. If I decide, you know, I don't need this reply, I can actually go to Insert Signatures. And let's say I actually want to change it to New Outgoing. It changes it to the New Outgoing. So as long as I have a signature, I can, I can select it. Or if I don't need it at all, I like to delete it. Any questions about signatures? So I do want to chat with you about a couple of things that are on this include. One is a calendar. The other is my business card. Remember, when I have different kind of business cards, I can select them. So other business cards, I can select any of these business cards to include. So I'm going to include mine. Okay, so add this. And then also, what I can do is send it forward. As you see this DCS, when the recipient gets this, all they have to do is click on this DCS file. And it adds to their Outlook contact, just how I have it right here. So it does save a lot of time if I want to forward my information over to somebody so they have my contact information. It's really nice and courtesy. So if I don't need it in line, I'm just going to get rid of it. If I still don't need to send it off, I can highlight my attachment and click Delete. Now here's another option that I can do. Sometimes I want to share my calendar event with somebody. So I can select to insert my calendar. This is just my calendar information. I can select a date range. Let's give the next seven days. And I can say, or yeah, let's specify date. And I actually want to go back a week or two. I'm going to say, OK. So it generates my calendar. And now it will forward over my calendar to those that I'm sharing this with. So if you go to me, if you go to Bill, if you go to anybody, and it will give them an idea of when I'm free. Now they can't schedule an appointment for me in my calendar, but they can suggest a time. So this will give them an opportunity to see when I'm in the office, when I'm not in the office. And it will say, hey, I'm busy here, I'm free here, I'm free here, I'm busy there. So it's really nice. I didn't have to do a lot of work to include it. I didn't have to type out my schedule. Just said, hey, include my schedule for these dates. If I don't need it, then I can delete it. This is just a table at that point. Undo and there it's on. That's inserting your calendar or a business card. This is also great, this business card, if you do the emails on behalf of someone else or there's a, perhaps a vendor or a colleague that you work with, and they want somebody's information, and you're sharing that information. 
for example, if I wanted to share uh, the business card of Bill, here's Bill, and then I would forward that information over to the people. This too. So I'm just going to delete that so I don't want to send it out to the public. So any questions about including these items on your email? Okay, so let's get out of this and start talking about our contact list. This is where you're going to see a little bit of difference between my version of Outlook and your version of Outlook. So right down here, I'm going to go to my contacts. And you'll see all of my contacts. And they're all in It makes it a lot easier for me to see who's who. And if I want to quickly find something, then I can go directly to the category. And sometimes people are in multiple categories, and that's okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about creating a new contact. I'm sure everybody's done this. But I want to talk about the organization of it. So I'm going to say new contact. <coughs> I'm going to say John Doe. And he worked for Acme Corp. And his title is uh, Vendor. Okay. And he at Acme. There probably is really a company called Acme, and there's a John Doe that works there, I'm sure. So right now, when by default, it displays the name and the email. I don't necessarily want to include this email, so I'm going to take that off. I want to add Acme at the end of John Doe, just so when I'm sending it off, and perhaps I have multiple John Doe's, that in the email itself, it will just show John Doe Acme. If he has a web page, okay, his IM address, if he has an IM address, and you see, it's building that business card as we see. His phone number. His home phone number, his business fax number, his mobile. You can have multiple phone numbers for each one. These are all the choices you get. And then an address. So I'm going to say one, two, three. Okay. Any town. A. There we go. So here's his business card. And the cool thing about this is if I make labels from my contact list, it's going to build the label for me because I have his address in there. This is the mailing address. So by default, this is the one that it's going to create a label for. If I wanted it to always go to his home, I can add a home address and say this is the mailing address. So business is fine. Now here's what I like to do as soon as I create a contact. I like to put it in a category. That way I can find it faster. If I'm dealing with a textbook vendor, then I want to go to that category. So John Doe is a vendor, and I have a category named vendor, so I'm just going to click on it. Again, if I, did, if I was creating a new category, it's just like doing the email. This is the same field setting. So I just say all, care, all categories, go to new, create a new one. So this one, he's a vendor, vendor. So I'm going to say he's a vendor. But let's say he's also a textbook person. I can select multiple categories. Um, might get a little sloppy, but I'm just going to create quick a few. There we go. So he gets all of these colors. Very pretty. But I'm going to save him and move on. Now John Doe is going to go into all of those categories. So if I scroll down to vendor, vendor, there's John Doe. If I go to textbook, there's John again. So he's in every single one of those categories that I put him in. So it doesn't matter. If I'm thinking of John as a textbook vendor, then I can go to textbook. If I'm thinking of him as just a vendor, then I can go to vendor. This is how I organize it. Now, if 
you decide, well, no, that's not how I want to view my um, contacts, then I can change the contacts instead of category, perhaps I say company or location or by name or whatnot. So maybe it's by company instead or full name. So this is a different view. And you'll see here are all the categories. But if I was trying to find John Doe here, I'm scrolling, 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 you know, and perhaps I'm not too sure who this John Doe is versus someone else. So that's why I like to view it in categories. So I can immediately jump over to that area. That's dealing with contacts. Now, if I want a distribution list, which you still see right here is called distribution list, but on my home tab, they call it a contact group. I don't know why they changed it, but they did. So if I want to create a contact group, I'm just going to click on contact group, aka distribution list. Now I'm going to choose my name. I can add my members. I can select from my Outlook contact, my address, or an email con a new email contact. I'm just going to say Outlook. I'm going to select a few of these. So every time I choose a person, I'm just going to say they are a member. So I'm just selecting at random at this point. You would be more careful, I'm sure. I say OK. So here's my distribution list, aka group. But let's say I accidentally added somebody I didn't mean to and select the person and I say remove member. Or if they have new contact information, I can say update now with my group. Actually, I actually have to name it first. And I say save and close. Now here's the thing. Number one, I didn't set a category, so it's up here in none. But the weird part about a 2010, now you, you probably won't have this happen to you, but the weird part about 2010 is that it just puts it in your contacts. It is not in my distribution list because it's just a group. Strange but true. So if I go down here, I don't have my new distribution group or list. So I'm going to go back to contact, grab this distribution list, and drop it in distribution list versus just a contact. So now I go over to distribution list, and it's here. I tried right clicking and say, OK, new distribution list. It's not there. This is the only way I figured out in 2010 to create a new quote unquote group a.k.a. distribution list. For you, for 2007, you should be able to do it under distribution list, but if you can't, that's how you do it. Make it in contact and then drag and drop it over into distribution list. Once you have your list, I can this group. I just double click to open it. I can forward this group to anybody else. So if I forward it, I can forward it over to you so you don't have to create this same list. I can forward it over to Lenore or Tom or anybody else. And you could just click on this and it would add it to your contacts. So any questions about distribution list or AKA groups? Hey, Tom, you're taking over? <laughs> no, sorry, that was an accident. You say, go ahead. Go type in an email and send it out to somebody. I don't mind. OK. So that's distribution list. I actually like the name distribution list <laughs> versus um, the group. It makes more sense, but that's what I was raised with, AKA. So let's go get back to contacts. And again, for distribution list, I'd probably add a category to it to organize it a little bit better. So let's go ahead and chat about hats. Now, in the prior 
webinars, I've jumped back and forth to the presentation. And I kind of don't want to do that because it just takes a little bit of time because of my multiple monitors. So I'm just going through um, the presentation but not popping back and forth. So I want to chat about PATH. I'm going to jump back to my email. And there's a couple of ways that we can do this. Number one, we talked about PATH from an email. Let's discuss creating a task just on a to-do list. So right down here, I'm going to click on tasks. And again, I apologize, all of my tasks are duplicated. But I'm going to go ahead and create a new task. Simple like that. I'm going to drag this over so you can see it. I'm going to give it a subject. I can give it a start date. So let's say I want to start this on Monday. I want to make sure it's done, completed by Thursday. And set a priority of normal, high, or low. So it's going to say normal for this one. I'm going to give it a category. So let's say this is for a presentation. I'm going to set a reminder. So although it's due on the 7th, I actually want a reminder on the 5th at 8 a.m. to trigger me to start working on this if I didn't already. If I click Save and Close right now, I just created a task. It's down here. But let's say this task isn't necessarily for me to do. It's for somebody else to do. So I'm going to go under Manage Task and assign this task. And good old Bill, he's going to be my guinea pig. I'm going to say to Bill Bergen. And I'm going to keep an updated copy of this task on my task list and send me a status report when this task is complete. Those two are default checks, and I want to leave it as such. This is what they mean. Send an updated copy of this task onto my task list. That means if Bill will get this task, he'll add it to his task list, and if he changes the complete, I will get an update. Okay. It will be updated on my list as the status changes on his end. The other thing is, send me a status report when the task is complete. As soon as Bill marks this complete, and then checks it off, I'll get an email saying, hey, Bill marked this complete. And then I can follow up with Bill and say, hey, did you really do this or were you ignoring my task? So I can say, send to Bill. And it goes to Bill. But you'll see it's still on my list of things so I can continuously see his update of this. So let me go ahead and open that up one more time. Send the status report. I can say, hey, how are you doing on this? So again, so maybe I forward this over to somebody else. I say, right now it's a new task for presentation. It has not been started. Zero completed. Actual work is zero. by Bill. Bill is now the owner of that because I assigned it to him. And I can forward this off to somebody else. Or I can say, hey, Bill, uh, I see you haven't worked on this. Where are you going with this? Or have you just not updated your task list? So it's a way for me to prompt him to work on it, as well as, let me close this out, as well as if he updates, I will get the updates directly from, from his outlook. Does that make sense? Now, let's say I need to update a task. So I'm going to select one that I actually am the owner. You'll see right that I'm the owner of here. I'm going to click on this guy. And I want to mark this as completed. Or I can say follow up. Um, let's say, well, let's mark as complete. 
because I want to get this done. I can either click on Done here or Mark Complete. Okay, and it crosses it off. It gives the date that I completed it, and it's at 100%. Or, if I don't no longer need it, I can remove it from my list over in my right list corner and just hit delete. Or I can say remove from list. Since it's done, I may not need to have it any longer. So I can say remove these from the list because I don't, they're just cluttering it up. So let's say I do need to change the completion. So right here on this item, I can say, hey, I'm 50% done with this. If I was working in conjunction with somebody, that's where the update would be sent to them and say, Lynn's marked this as 50% completed. If this was a big project, you would want to make sure that you're updating your completeness uh, ratio because you can trigger that with a whole group of people. You can imagine, let's say I was writing a 500-page document with a group of 10 people. They could see on my end, I'm dealing with 10 pages. Maybe I have five written. I can say I'm 50% done. So everybody else working on this project can see how far along I am, and I can see how far along they are. So I don't need this tab, so I'm just going to remove it from my list. No longer on my list. So how are we doing with tasks? Pretty straightforward for tasks. It's just some things you may not be aware of that are out there. So now let's talk about the biggest thing about your Outlook. That's your calendar. I'm going to share my calendar with you. And I want to show you and talk about a little bit about my calendar. Number one, it's right now set on a day setting. So I can show you a work week. I can show you a week. I can show you a month. Okay. So that's just what I'm doing for my one calendar. But I actually have multiple calendars. And this is the reason why I have multiple calendars. I'm not talking about shared calendars. I'm talking about, for me, for Lynn, I have multiple calendars. I have a total of six. On the left-hand side, you'll see calendar. That's my default calendar. That's the schedule for me personally. Then I have calendars for other things that I schedule. I have five technology labs that I schedule activities in. So I made calendars for them. That way it's a lot easier to see conflicts. I can see when rooms are open a lot easier. So I'm going to change my view from the month to the day. And I'm going to start opening up my calendar. By default, it changes over to the scheduled view. It's not my favorite view. I actually like the day view. And now what I can see is here's my calendar. But now I can see all the rooms. So if somebody calls me up and they say, hey, Lynn, I need a computer lab room. What do you have available at 3 o'clock? So at 3 o'clock, I have three rooms open. I can immediately make an appointment, block off the room, and I know for sure I'm not going to have conflict because I've scheduled that room in, the, in its appropriate calendar. But how did I get there from here? Well, to create a new calendar, I went to New Items, Calendar. Okay. So, pardon me. I right click on my calendar, and I can say, where's my new calendar? Uh, new calendar group. Sorry, there we go. I can select a group. Eh, I don't want group. Sorry about that. I haven't done this in such a long time. Uh, so let me get rid of this guy. Delete that group. And it just should be a new calendar. There we go. I had to get out of my group and into the calendar area. So new calendar. And I'll show you that one more time. My apologies. I selected or right-clicked on calendar. And I say new calendar. 
so I'm not trigger happy. I'm going to name my calendar. So, presentation. Say okay. So here's my presentation calendar. Again, I like the day view, so they're all side by side. Here's my calendar right here. I don't need my share to open right now. I'm going to close that. Here's my presentation view. And now I can have a calendar just for doing presentations. If I don't need to always see that one, I can deselect it. And sometimes I don't always have to see my own calendar, but I always have to see the room calendar. So that's open. That's dealing with multiple calendars. There's another cool thing about multiple calendars. So I'm going to go ahead and turn back on the calendar. I'm going to deselect most of the room calendars. I'm going to create a phony uh, presentation here. So here's my appointment. I double clicked where I wanted to go. I'm going to name it as in, oh, let's do an app one. And that's going to go until, I don't know, uh, let's say it goes until um, 2.30. And I want to categorize it because I like color. And we'll call it training. And I can invite people along if I want to right now, but we'll talk about that in a second. I'm going to save and close. Okay. Now here's the cool part. Let's say you manage multiple calendars. What I can do is put it in an overlay view. And I say overlay, overlay, overlay. So now, because I've overlaid all of my calendars that I work with, I can see when do I have a block of time that I actually have free to possibly schedule. It. So I'm going to add a, an appointment. Now, here's the thing. Clicking on add an appointment, Here's an appointment. I'm going to get out of overlay. You'll see, it, unfortunately, it does not put it on every single calendar. It only puts it on your top calendar. Okay. So we, we can't do it that lovely. But here's the thing I can do is I'm going to get out of overlay view. Let's say I need the presentation and my calendar to line up. I can drag and drop, and now they're on both calendars. So drag and drop, drag and drop. Now everybody's scheduled for that for the, that appointment. If one person doesn't, or if one calendar doesn't need it, I can select on it and delete. There we go. So now when I overlay, to see everybody has that appointment except. There we go. Room 110 is not showing up. It's in blue. Any of their appointments would be in that blue right here. So they're available. Okay. I really like that overlay if I have multiple calendars going on and I need to align for a meeting or see what folks are doing. Speaking of sharing, I do share my calendars for the room. Reason is, although I schedule these rooms, other departments need to see when they're available. But I don't want them necessarily to have access to making an appointment or scheduling a room. So what I can do is I can send an invitation to share my calendar. That's what this type is. So I'm going to go to room 107B. I'm going to right click on it. I'm going to go down to Share, and I can go ahead and share my calendar. Not email my calendar, share my calendar. And I say OK. Now it's going to ask, who do you want to share it with? Now I'm going to say, good old Bill. It's going to get all these emails on Monday and say, what? And then I can choose, the, should I give Bill the power to add edit, and delete items in my calendar. This is when you decide up front what you want to do. Now, you can change it later, 
But I want you to be very careful about this. If this is a calendar that, yes, indeed, you need multiple owners, then go ahead and select this. I don't do that because I want to make sure that folks don't accidentally delete something or they accidentally add something to this calendar versus their own calendar. I mean, several times I've added an appointment on room 109 when I wanted it on room 110. Well, since it's my calendar, that, that kind of goof was caught pretty quickly. But if somebody else did that, then I wouldn't know if it was an error or not. So I want you to be very careful if you're going to add your, if you're going to um, share your calendar, just be very, very careful about who you give the power to edit. And then I select send. And I say yes. And I say yes. And it goes out. That was just, do I want to permit him to see all the details? everything there. And it just goes. It takes a, a minute to go. And then he'll get an email saying, hey, Lynn sent you her calendar. Do you want to share it? So I'm actually going to cancel this because it's taking a little bit longer than normal to share it. But what would happen is in his Outlook, under his shared calendars, he would then see, once he accepts it, room 107B down here on his list of shared calendars. And again, he doesn't have to always see that turned on. You can either see it or not. But I don't always have to see Ron's calendar, so I only turn it on when I need to know where he is. Okay, so any questions about sharing your calendar? And again, I just want you to be careful about sending your calendar or sharing your calendar and giving that editing um, issues. But let's say you accidentally, oh, what did you do? And you took over me. I'm going to go ahead and That was so Let's see if I can get it, get it back from Tom. There we go. Uh, let me do my... Sorry about that, guys. That was Tom. Okay. Turn my email once again. Okay. So let's say you accidentally gave somebody that permission and you want to take it back. You want to revoke that privilege now. So basically what you do is you go back to your calendar that you shared, go down to your share, and it will show you your calendar permission. So right now, you'll see everybody that I share this to. And right now, face out how it says reviewer, reviewer, reviewer. Even though all these people can see this calendar, they all are reviewers. This is the moment where I can say, you know, I actually want Mill to be able to own it, publish editor, or non-editing author or contributor. These are all different options that you have. And you'll see if I select contributor, then they're allowed to create items. Okay. So again, I want to be very careful. I want to just say he can re review it, which means he can read it, the full details, but he can't write to it. That's if I wanted to change this permission setting. So again, that's right-clicking on the calendar that you have, going to your share and calendar permissions. While we're here, let me chat about turn off a lot of these other books and just talk about the one calendar. I have some options here on my calendar that I can change. Now, when I'm talking about the calendar options, it's, it's different depending on where your exchange is. I can publish my calendar, this sharing also, but I can publish my calendar online. This is if you're dealing with an exchange server and you can publish it to Outlook, or pardon me, office.com. But this is also where you would do from 
fun. Uh, I think it's from if you use SharePoint as well. So share your published calendar. This is if you use SharePoint. I think you guys do use SharePoint. So if you wanted to publish it for everybody to see, where you're not just sharing it, but you're just publishing it to where folks can see it, you would go to Publish Online. You can also get the calendar permissions right here as well. So let's see how I want to um, work with this calendar option. Um, let's go with a new appointment. And I want to invite some folks along. So I'm going to say presentation. And I'm going to say a location, the so room 02 or, or one zero, uh, 102, we'll call it. I'll select a date and time. And I'll invite some attendees. So good old Bill's going to go. Now this is where this, amount, this appointment is going to be sent over to Bill like an email or in an email. And again, I can have response options with the attendee. So I want to request a response, either by default, or allow a new time proposal. Now if this time pro proposed, is set in stone, I want to deselect that option. So you'll see it's now deselected. Then to request a response, meaning once they get this and they put it into their calendar, I, it triggers me that they've either accepted it or rejected it. And I'll show you what it looks like. I'm just going to delete this guy. Go into my email, because I have lots and lots of these. So I'm going to go into my schedule here. Okay. What I receive is either a X, which means they decided not to take that appointment, or I get a check mark saying, yes, they did make the appointment. They accepted that appointment. Okay, So you'll see it triggers me that, yes, they're on task with that. So they have that in their calendar as well as I do. This only works if they use Outlook. What they see is an invitation for a specific date and time or an item. But the thing of it is, is if they don't have Outlook, they see all the text. But they wouldn't be able to add it to a calendar because they don't have the calendar. But they can either, at that point, they can't, if they don't have Outlook, they can't accept it or reject it. They would have to manually put it somewhere to keep track of it or keep that email or print off the email. Okay, so any questions about making an appointment and adding attendees? And then the last thing I want to chat about with the calendar is making a reoccurring appointment. And I do this all the time with the rooms. And you'll see, I'm just going to select on one of the rooms and I'll give you the work week. This appointment for a computer application class runs for 18 weeks, and it's every Tuesday and Thursday. Well, I don't want to have to add that one by one by one for all 36 appointments. So what I'll do, and I'll just do it to my calendar, I'm going to create a reoccurring appointment, and let's say it's on Saturdays at 9 o'clock. So I'll say, um, Mow the lawn. Okay. And I want to do that from 9 a.m. to 9.30, and the location is home. And I want to make this every Saturday. Okay. Again, I would probably put it under a category, and since this is for me, I have an X personal, because it puts it always on the bottom. That's why the X. And I'm going to make this a recurrent. So, right now, the start time is 9 a.m. I could change this if I needed to. The end time is 9.30, and the duration is 30 minutes. If I changed it to where it was an hour, then it automatically updates it. But I only need a half an hour. I have a very small yard. This happens weekly. It's every Saturday currently. It starts this Saturday, and I can say, 15 occurrences, or 
I can say an in site specific date. Let's say it ends uh, November, let's say October. Starting to get into fall, I don't need to mow the lawn that often. And I say OK. And I save it. And now, every Saturday, as long as I'm cooking on Saturdays, you'll see it there. Every week, I have a Saturday occurrence to mow the yard, mow the lawn. And I only have to do it once for the duration of this. Now, here's the thing. Let's say that I have a hot I'm not going to be in town that day. So I can go to that appointment. And I can hit delete. Now it asks me, do you want to delete this occurrence, or do you want to delete the entire series? Well, for this one, I just want to delete the one occurrence. So I say OK. And you'll see the previous week, it's there. On the 30th, it's not. But then on the 7th, again, it returns. That's setting up a reoccurring appointment. And again, I can select put that or, or to request an attendee, so that would be on their calendar. But what I would do is first, I would set it up in my calendar, delete any occurrence that I didn't need, and then send it over. Because this is what happens. If I don't do that first, any time that I make a change to this one appointment, it's going to ask me to send an update to that person. If it's a cancellation, it will send update on a cancellation for a specific appointment. So it's just better if you get it straight and forward in the very beginning, set it all up on your side, and then send out the um, request for attendance to the others or, or that uh, appointment to anybody else. But in the event, if you need to change it later on, then you can. It just sends an update. If you don't send an update, it's not going to update it in your calendar either. So any changes you make, an update needs to be sent out. So how are we doing out there? I'm going to go ahead and pop out of the sharing. And I'm going to go through, and you'll see we've covered all this. I'm going to open it up to everybody else. So does anybody else have any topics or questions that they want to shoot my way? No, none? I must have done an awesome job. <laughs> so no questions? Or did I lose you all? <laughs> Thanks, Tom. OK, so that's it for me. Yay. So here's my field. Let me just click on. I do want to promote some things coming up with At One. And I'm sure you guys have already heard this. I know, Glenda, you have. So upcoming in May, we're going to have some webinars based on getting you up to speed with 2010. So there's several of us that are going to do the presentations on Word, Excel, Access, Outlook, and PowerPoint, I believe. And those will be up in May for you. So if you didn't get to see it, or if you don't get to see it live, we do record them. And they'll be up for your pleasure, your viewing enjoyment. They are free of charge to you. So all you would need to go to is our, the At One website, one for training dot org. one O-N-E-F-O-R-T-R-A-I-N-I-N-G dot org. And um, you can see it there. Karen, you had a question? Uh, yeah. Is, is there a way to show your task r right on your calendar page? Yes. Or because you just have to look at the bottom? Your task is a task. It's not an appointment. So when I go back to my let me application with you, and what happens is when I'm in my calendar, I do have a view uh, right down here on my task. This is where my task would be. Okay. So I have a task area on my calendar. Let me close out all this 
the garbage there. So here's my work week calendar. So I do have a task coming up. Now let me bring it back to today, this week, and you'll see I have some tasks. That's part of your viewing option. But if you're asking me tasks to put on your calendar appointments, they're, they're different. A task is versus an appointment is actually an appointment. I mean, <laughs> no other way to say it. But you can view your tasks the same time you're viewing your calendar. And that's on your view. And it's the option, daily task list. Here's your daily task list. I can turn it off and turn it back on. Okay. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, yeah, sort of. Um, I have this issue where I need to have on my calendar my hours that I'm open um, yes. to remind my supervisor when I'm here. Yes. And then it doesn't want to let me put in an appointment in the, that time. It's going to want to move it over and show a conflict, in essence. Yeah. So, if, for instance, if I say I'm here Mondays from 8 to 5, and I can show it as uh, free, we'll say, and I just want to put a color to it. So, yeah, that's too dark. So let me go and categorize it and clear my category. So as long as I've blocked off this time, as soon as I add anything else, it's going to show it up as a conflict. And it pushes it over. Um, what I would do is create a second calendar for your working hours. And then what you can do is overlay it with any appointments so you get both of them at the same time. OK. Yeah, that makes sense. Creating the, the individual calendar with you when your open hours are. OK. Yep. That would be my resolution because, again, I have so many rooms that have different schedules, it would be so cluttered on one calendar. So I created a second calendar and a third and a fourth and a sixth. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? That was a great question. <laughs> All righty. So, Lenore, are you there? I am here. Okay. So, um, since we don't have any questions, do you want to in or you want to hang around for a bit and see if any questions pop to mind? Um, no, I I don't have any questions. Tom, do you? She answered every single question I had. I, I just have a problem with Glenda having learned how to um, send a message to individual people. Um, she told Lynn I was being weird today. <laughs> did you see my reply? I did. <laughs> just today? <laughs> just, just today? today. <laughs> you, I thought you couldn't see that. I thought it was just between Lynn and I. I think you must have said it to all moderators because I saw it too. Oh, well. <laughs> You're used to that, Lenore. I know. And you didn't come over for veggie squares. That's your loss. I know. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. You're yeah, welcome. It's awesome. really, truly been a pleasure working with you. Live. Thank you, too, Lynn. You guys have a good weekend. Thanks. Bye, you guys. too. Thank you.